What is going on with Henry Louis Gates? What is going on with Cornel West? Who shall, who says that black leaders, serious black leaders, must be race transcending? <laughs> you know, hmm. How the hell are you going to be a serious black leader and be race transcending? <laughs> you know? But that's the dilemma of the assimilationists. They want race and not race at the same time. They want to organize black people based on blackness so that they can get rid of blackness. They want to use your black interests, your black feelings, and your black identity to advance their program so they can tell you later that blackness does not matter. That color has nothing to do with it. We are better off when we don't even refer to ourselves as black. We are better off when we amalgamate with the other people to the point of invisibility. If power is based on a collective identity, if power is based on social cooperation, if power is based on shared history and shared values and shared goals, how can you have power when you tell people that they cannot identify themselves on any basis whatsoever and that they should become individuals without any identity whatsoever? So consequently, this organization cannot empower black people. As a matter of fact, when we look at this history, we recognize immediately that this organization has not only been wrong-headed, it has actually been destructive to black people. And therefore, the assimilationist moralist leadership must be destroyed and a new leadership structure built on its ruins. Yes. You don't want to deal with it, then stay with it and die. Yes. This is the deal. There's only one serious leadership structure available for African people. And that's the leadership struggle provided by African nationalism. It's the only way to go. It's no other way around. You must understand, but see, some people have deceived you about nationalism. What nationalism is and what it isn't. Some people have told you that nationalism means race hatred. That it means, you know, one race being superior to another race. It's the same kind of joke that they tried to tell you about uh, Afrocentrism being the mirror image of what? Eurocentrism. It's a joke. It's not true. Understand what nationalism is. Nationalism is an ideology of a thousand faces. While we may have a similar sense of what it is, it involves no one definition that can be agreed on. No two types of nationalism are the same, ladies and gentlemen. And we have to recognize that. Nationalism is very important. Nationalism, allied with the sense of nation, offers unity and mutual support, solidarity and identity, structure and cohesion to people who otherwise may feel atomized, insecure, vulnerable, and bereft of stabilizing norms, values, and affirmative social relations. Through, nation, through nationness and nationalism, the individual transcends his existential aloneness and shares in the much broader virtues and power of the group. His power and that of the group to which he belongs are one. And let us look at nationalism. Nationalism creates focused power which enables the people to achieve ends, which is separate individuals pursuing their own unrelated self-interested ends they could never achieve. The power generated by nationalism is the bane and harbinger of destruction for those who wish to establish or maintain imperial control over other people. What are we saying here then? That some nations may use nationalism as a means of unifying themselves, of creating self-determination, and after doing so, to fill themselves with an ideology of racial superiority and an ideology of manifest destiny, and using their nationalism combined with the sense of manifest destiny and racial superiority, enslave other people and colonize other people. And this is the essence of European nationalism. But the essence of African nationalism is a different type 
and of a different kind. And we have to understand that clearly someone, before someone confuses us. Black African nationalism is a nationalism of liberation and self-determination, not of conquest and domination. It is premised on the percept that blacks and African people shall not be the subjects of another people, nor should they subject themselves to other people. That black peoples and nations should exercise the full rights to develop and utilize their material, human and spiritual resources primarily for their own benefit and well-being and for the benefit and well-being of others as they see fit. That they are not the inferiors of others and not destined by God or man to exist in the forced servitude of others. And when and if and for whatever and however long they may be the willfully subjected to the domination of others, they are commissioned and they are obligated by their inalienable rights as human beings to freedom to resist such domination and overthrow it as soon as humanly possible. So when we talk about an African nationalism, we are not talking about an ad, a nationalism of racial superiority, a nationalism where we intend to conquer and rule and enslave another people. An African nationalism is needed to liberate us from the nationalism of others. Nationalism evokes a sense of cohesion and belonging in a people that permits them to cooperate and to coordinate their activities and to align themselves in order to achieve their national and individual freedom. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it is this leadership that must move to the fore because the others have been made, have been weighed and measured and been found wanting. We see the condition of our people as a result of the leadership of these other groups. One of the major things in the Marcus Garvey legacy was that of his perception of reality. I often talk about reality in my classes and general lectures so that attendees would recognize that at the center of one's adjustment to the world, at the center of one's ability to deal with the world, to change with the world, to suit one's advantage is a knowledge of reality. The very essence of pathology, whether political, ideological, economic, social, or psychological, is a lack of knowledge of reality. How can one deal with reality if one does not know what it is? How can you deal with reality if you are blind to it or if it is distorted? It is somewhat interesting that the brain is locked up in the darkness of the skull, yet the brain is the central unit that guides our behavior. It guides that behavior based on, based on the information it receives from our senses. Therefore, our senses must relate, must relate to the brain an accurate knowledge of reality. This is the only knowledge, ultimately, that the brain gets from the outside world. The brain using its innate capacities, such as reasoning capacities, comparative capacities, basic knowledge, memory, and experience, uses the information given to it by the senses to determine how the person is going to deal and cope with reality. How the individual is going to shape reality to its own purposes. Therefore, if that transformation is Excuse me. Therefore, if that information is distorted, then the brain determines behavior on that distorted information and the individual is maladjusted. This is the case with this. This is the case then with a people. And this is the case then with black people. And happy Monday. Welcome back to On the Shoulders of Giants. I am Joseph Ward and we are doing the second video. In case. What is going on with Carnell West? Happy Monday and welcome back to On the Shoulders of Giants. I am Joseph Ward and we are continuing. This is the second video, but we're continuing our reading and reviewing of Dr. Amos Wilson's book, African Centered Consciousness versus the New World Order, Garveyism in the Age of Globalism. And today's reading is going from page 43 to page 66. And um, 
this is getting into this this section is getting into the legacy of Marcus Garvey. Now, the particular part, the portion that I started reading, is about um, is in part one. It start on page forty three, part one, but under the title of Garvey and the structuring of reality and perception. Perception is the subtitle under Garvey and the structuring of reality. And Garvey and the structuring of reality starts on page forty five. I started at the last paragraph on page 46, perception, how we view reality, how we perceive reality versus what the actual reality is. I talk all the time on this channel about us getting out of our feelings. I talk all the time on this channel about us living in reality as much as possible us being realistic about our situation and what's happening to us what has happening to us and what can happen to us in the future um getting away from ideal and dealing with reality because we can shape the ideal world we want to if we deal with our reality and the reality is we are in a colonized people who are at the point of insanity and the we've been programmed by our oppressors to destroy ourselves and we are destroying ourselves we're getting worse we're degrading and it's time for us to make a change now before we won't be able to make any serious positive change for black america to have any type of advancement or any type of forward movement to overthrowing oppression or getting rid of oppression, getting rid of those who control us, those who hold us down, getting rid of the, of the programming, building for self, because we're talking about assimilation slash integration versus nationalism, which is best for us. Garvey, People in the mindset of Garvey and Dr. Amos Wilson is pushing nationalism. Black liberal democratic political leaders of today are still pushing emulation, uh, assimilation, still pushing integration. We need to be a part of their system. We still champion black people becoming the first of this and the first of that within white systems. Success in the black community is us being as accepted and as elevated within white structures as possible. That's success for us. It's not necessarily us building for us. It's us being elevated within white systems and white structures. That is success for us. That is what we, we uh, celebrate. That is what we hold up. That is what we, we push to integrate and assimilate versus to have our own and build our own power structure. Remember, if you are assimilated and integrated into white America and you are dependent upon white America, when white America falls, you fall, you fall even harder. So this is where we are. So I'm going to continue my reading, picking up on page 46, perception of self-knowledge, a perception and self-knowledge. I also see in the legacy of Marcus Garvey, the legacy of self-knowledge. Teachers, wise men and women from Eon's path have indicated that the foundations of reality and wisdom rest on a knowledge of self, knowing self. We know that at every center of Egyptian philosophy was the admonition, knowledge, I mean, know thyself. This is the essence of wisdom. Garvey does recognize that a lack of knowledge and amnesia about who and what we are is pathological. That's why he talked about a tree with no roots. A tree with no roots is going to die. A tree with no roots has no future. You have to know who you are and where you come from. But not to get stuck in the past, but to, to fertilize the future. Um, we recognize today in psychology that amnesia is, is a pathological state. It's the pathological state of mind that a people who suffer from a lack of knowledge of themselves and of their history, a lack of knowledge of their condition, or a people who suffer from a loss of identity, right? 
we recognize as Garvey suffer as Garvey recognized that this lack of self-knowledge was deliberately introduced into the mind and psyche of black people. We could not be Africans and slaves at the same time. We could not be Africans and slaves at the same time. Let me find my place. Uh oh. Okay. We could not be hold. We cannot hold on to our African our, our our African identity, our African selves, knowledge of our African culture, and be enslaved. All right. The subordinates of another people. That's what we should remain. That's what they want us to remain. It is only when that knowledge is removed, erased, degraded, stolen, taken, and distorted that we lose our identity. It is, it is then that an identity is placed upon us by another people and by external forces. Therefore, a lack of knowledge, a lack of self-knowledge is a lack of self-awareness. A lack of self-awareness is an insensitivity to the self. But an insensitivity in the self is also an, insens an insensitivity to the reality and to the outside world. Without the sensitivity Without the sensitivity of the outside world and the self, we are left to blindly stumble from one point to another. Ultimately, self-knowledge in, in its deepest sense is a knowledge of others. We cannot really get to know ourselves deeply without the essence of knowing our enemies and friends, without ultimately knowing the creator in whatever form or fashion. It reasons to it reasons that to know the self ultimately involves moving beyond the self and seeing the world from the vantage point of universalism. But it starts with reality. It starts with honesty. It starts with us being real with ourselves and who we are. We are a people who were stripped of our identity. We are people who were stripped of our Africanness. And we were given white culture, white American culture, white European culture, white English culture that evolved to Southern white American culture or in Midwest and Northern white American culture. We adopted the cultures of the people who were around us. When our culture, when our way of life, when our identity, when our reality was taken away from us, it was replaced by the ones that were around us. And those were the ones who enslaved us. Those were the ones who propped up and supported the system of slavery and oppression of black people, African people. So to not reclaim that will means that you are accepting your lot in life as oppressed people. To not reclaim that means that you are OK with being the the slaves of white people, of the white supremacists. And then, therefore, I must further integrate into the white system and elevate myself into the white system and contribute to the uplifting and the rising of the white system and making the white system better. While our black systems don't even exist, forget declining systems, our systems don't even exist. All of the black people who see themselves as something only see themselves as something within the white system, which is a problem. Black nationalism, black self-sufficiency, black self-reliance, a black self-ideal, a black self-identity is needed. It's important. This is a game of races. It's a team game, and we are the only one who are a disorganized team. So um, perception and lack of self-knowledge. In psychology, we also recognize that at the, center of, at the center of pathology is the individual's inability to control the self. One of the amazing things about the human mind, when one looks at it from the point and view of the so-called unconscious, it's that the individual who does not know himself and does not know reality is the individual who, who escapes from self-knowledge is an individual who does not know the roots and the basis of his actions. He is an individual who seems to be determined by external 
forces or by internal forces of which he has little or no knowledge or even control. He is often constantly puzzled by his own behavior. He is often a wonderment to himself. He struggles, he struggles against impulses, desires, and wishes over which he has little or no control because he has, in his escape from self-knowledge and reality, conceded his self-control and given it over to someone else. In releasing his identity and permitting another to place an identity within his psyche, he has at the same time placed in the hands of the other the ability to control his behavior. When we give up our self-control, when we don't develop self-control, when we don't develop discipline, structure, we allow others to control us and we allow ourselves to be out of control and we allow ourselves to be vulnerable to decline and vulnerable to our enemies, vulnerable to mishaps, vulnerable to mistakes, vulnerable to, to just destruction, vulnerable to being misguided, to being miseducated, vulnerable to being misled. We are an, an, an impulsive person is a destructive person. That person is on the clock. They are going to destroy themselves. People who cannot control themselves, adults who cannot control themselves are destructive. And we have become a group of people with a, who lack self-control. We, we lack knowledge of self and we lack the ability to control ourselves. we are guided by the need to consume the need to assimilate the need to reassure the need to prove the need to to the need to be oversexed just just all type of destructive stuff we cannot control ourselves once we get the feeling we are feeling we are very feeling based per people whether male or female whether male or female, you should be able to control your feelings and control your urges. And because we cannot, we will remain subservient. We will remain second, third, fourth class citizens until we change that. But we have to be adult enough and honest enough about who we are and where we are in this reality, in this place and time in America. And stop acting like we have our stuff together because we don't. That is a part of the distorted reality. We see in Marcus Garvey's legacy that if we are to control our destiny, then we must control ourselves. If we are to control our destiny, then we must control ourselves. We continue to just operate off of impulse. It feels good. It feels right. It makes me feel better. Feel, 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 feel. It feels good. Yeah. But we are declining. My feelings matter. No, they don't. Your feelings do not matter. Your, your feelings only matter to you. And part of the time, they don't even matter to you. Your feelings do not matter. No, they don't. No, they don't, because they're destructive. Often we see in the neurotic and pathological individual, one who has little self-esteem and self-acceptance. The acceptance of reality, which I referred to in the beginning, ultimately must be the acceptance of oneself. The acceptance of reality, as Marcus Garvey recognized and, pro and projected, ultimately must mean the acceptance of our Africanicity, the acceptance of the fact that we are an African people. Yes, we are. Yes, we are African people. We are an African people. We might be an Americanized people, but we are an African people. That doesn't take away us being black people in America, but we are an African people. It seems a bit simple when we state it. It seems a bit obvious. However, when we engage in psychotherapy, we Recognize that sometimes we have the patient who comes into the office who is intellectually aware and can quite often lecture the therapist in terms of theoretical ideas and the theoretical grounds of his therapeutic work, but who has not recognized and confronted himself emotionally, who has not really, 
who is not really in his heart accepted what he knows. What I'm stating here is that while we may recognize superficially and intellectually that it is important we accept the reality of our African history, we must recognize deeply in our hearts, in the very bottoms of our psyches, our Africanicity. We are African people. We are of the African diaspora. We are of the African bloodlines. But we are Black people in America. We are Americanized Black people who have been here over 400 years. So we have culture and identity in America, but we have roots in Africa. And if you don't understand your roots, you're going to die. We are a blank slate. We were a blank slate. They took they took everything away from us. We were a blank slate, and that blank slate was filled up. The programming was replaced with something that the 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 free the freeman's mind was replaced with the slave mind. The free African mind was replaced with the with the enslaved nigger minds. We must recognize that we are an African people and we will be African people until the end of time. And we must accept all that goes with that. We must accept the good, the bad, and all of the possibilities that go with being African people. We must accept the fact that this white man is never going to accept us totally. And we must get used to the idea Hope is a wonderful thing in some senses. Oh, hope, oh, hope, oh, hope, oh, hope, right? Hope is a wonderful thing in some senses, but it can be pathological in others. The neurotic individual uses hope in a, patho in a pathological way. He lives in hope and does not know when to give up. There's a time that hope has to be given up when one looks at a reality and recognizes the reality for what it is and one accepts certain aspects of that reality and moves on it. The hope that this white man is going to accept you as one of his own is one of those hopes you must give up because you are being totally pathological. They have not accepted us thus far. And why do they need to accept us? They just need to continue to exploit us. Think about it. They don't need us to be their friends. They don't need us to be pal pals with them and, and try to integrate into their family and society. They just need us to continue to be a viable labor class. Think about it. If they needed us, we would we would be we would have more access. We would have more wealth, power, land, and resources if they actually needed us. He recognized we must, excuse me, he recognized as we must recognize today that we cannot give self-acceptance through another people accepting us as one of them. Self-acceptance can only be achieved through the self. We must not wait for our enemies to approve us and to so-called accept us as a way of accepting ourselves. Because ladies and gentlemen, our enemies, their very lives and their very way of life depending upon our non-acceptance. Uh, is it, dependent upon our non-self acceptance. The system of white supremacy is dependent upon black people in America and black people around the world not accepting who we truly are and accepting the integrationalist ideas that we must be a part of white America to be somebody. If the foundation of their very culture and the foundation of their economic, political, and social system is one that is founded upon the subordination of black people, then you must recognize that they are not going to give that up. For it would be like giving up their very lives and their very existence itself. Therefore, for us to wait around and to wait around in the vain hope that through their acceptance, we will come to accept ourselves. It is to wait for nothing because we will gain nothing as a result of this kind of illusion. All right. Self-acceptance start with us on the inside of how we choose to see ourselves and believe in ourselves and behave and accept ourselves. Nothing external can, uh, can make us accept ourselves and see ourselves in a better light. It has to start here on the inside with us as black people. White supremacy should not have any influence in the way that we see ourselves and love ourselves and honor ourselves and value ourselves. 
But because we have been conditioned by the system of white supremacy, it controls every aspect of our psyche. We see in Marcus Garvey and in his legacy, a confrontation with self-acceptance and all that implies. He helped us to accept ourselves through a study of our history and the study of our past. But we will see that he did not get stuck in history, all right? That he was very much in the present and very much into the future. This is not about getting stuck in the past. That's why I read that. This is not about focusing on the past so much that we lose folk, that we lose sight of what's happening in front of us. That will that will be counter to us accepting reality for what it really is, accepting our actual reality as we are as black people here in America at this time and place in 2023 in America, accepting who we are, what we are, where we are, and why we are here, and what are we going to do to change it. In a realistic sense, what are we going to do to get real tangible changes and have our reality be the one that we create for ourselves? absent of the system of white supremacy because that's the goal is to overthrow and replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice right that's the goal right so ladies and gentlemen if you imitate and identify with your oppressor since the oppressor treats us with disdain and de uh, degradation treats us with destructive impulses and desires, will not the imitation of our oppressor now mean that we would then be an imitation of this oppressive being and thus we would engage also in self-destructive and self-degradation? If you imitate the behavior of oppressive people who are oppressing you, then you in turn will oppress yourself because you will see yourself as something that needs to be oppressed because you are intimidated. You are uh, <laughs> imitating the behavior and the ideas of your oppressor. If we think the way of our oppressor thinks, then we won't think about ourselves in the way our oppressor thinks about us. If we talk about, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, let me, hold on, let me, I messed that up, hold on. If we think, if we think the way our oppressors think, won't we think about ourselves the way our oppressor thinks about us? If we talk the way our oppressors talk, won't we curse ourselves the way our oppressor curses us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we ride these subways day in and day out and look at the behavior of our people in these communities, we can see people imitating their oppressor. And imitating their oppressor, they perform the work of their oppressor in terms of self-destruction and self abnegation And therefore, the oppressor don't have to do it. They don't have to do a whole lot of the work because we're doing it to ourselves. Imitation of the oppressor is then equivalent to the treatment of the self and one's fellows just as the oppressor would treat us. It is equal to the treatment of the self and the group in a destructive manner. It equals the lack of self-respect and respect for the group since the oppressor lacks respect for us as individuals and, and as a group. If our oppressors exploit us, then the imitation of our oppressors means self-exploitation. Self Consequently, we see in the legacy of Marcus Garvey a moving away from the imitation of our oppressors and a moving toward the identification with all that is African. Marcus Garvey recognized as well as we must as people love one another. As all great teachers have taught, love is the foundation for any group's cohesiveness and unity for purpose. Love is the greatest inhibitor of aggression and internal conflict. It is the means by which the group cares and shares for itself its resources. It is the means by which the group harnesses its resources and defends itself against the insecurities of its enemies, of, excuse me, in the incursions of its enemies. We have a philosophy here today that often only permits love to take place in terms of outside of ourselves, in terms of people external to ourselves. At the corner of the integrationalist movement, it is the consciousness and the unconscious ideology that if we can get our, our enemies to love us, then we can get around to loving ourselves, which is bull. But as I pointed out earlier, 
if the enemy's status, economic, social, and otherwise, uh, relies on his cultivation and maintaining of hatred toward us, then that enemy will never get around to loving us. And that's the point of oppression. That's the point of being the enemy. That's the whole point. The hell am I love you for? My whole intention is to keep you oppressed. The hell, the hell would I waste my time trying to love you? That's dumb. Only an idiot would expect their oppressors and their enemies to love them. Only a damn fool. Ultimate freedom and independence is found is founded on production upon the creation of employment, upon the creation of labor and creation of products for our own consumption. But that would take us being able to see the value in ourselves enough for us to produce for ourselves. When we look in the world today, we will see that the powerful nations and the people are producing people, not consuming people. As I've often said, you cannot consume yourself into equality. Black people, I don't care how much of that expensive stuff y'all buy, you still niggas. You cannot consume yourself into power. Those nations who depend upon consumption will see as they consume the product of others and do not produce themselves that they will consume that, that that they will be consumed by others because they will always be dependent upon others for their consumption for their everyday lives for their for for stuff to just exist you are dependent upon others because you decided to never produce to only consume you can give the world nothing you only take Looking at these few statements in regard to the legacy of Marcus Garvey, there must be in some of your minds the question, did it succeed? And if so, why are we in the state we are in today? I must frankly state that I am somewhat disturbed by the fact that to a degree, even though certainly the spirit of Marcus Garvey lives in the heart of many of us, it is not manifested. It has not manifested itself as much as it should have and as much as it can. As a matter of fact, when we look at our situation today, we see an actual decline in the black economic development, not only in this country, but on, but in the world in general. We have been writing the last few years, even in this country, a backward side in our economic and political development. What happened in terms of the legacy of Marcus Garvey? So this book was written, was published in 1999. And the words still hold true today. Published in 1999 and the words still hold true today. All right, so let's move on now to irony of education. When we deal with an assimilationist leadership that sees solutions to our problems as getting our children more soundly educated in the lives, we're going to see a decline in the destruction of African people who think that their salvation is one big education uh, as is of one being educated by the very people who destroyed them in the first place. We have a paradox there. Why is it that the arbiter of truth, the validators of truth are the very people who lie to us the most? I often have to remind my students and my audiences that where I say something, you would have a hard time believing. But if I was a white man, if I, but if a white man comes in and say the same thing, you believe it right away. You have been conditioned to accept truth and to see truth as coming out of the mouths of the liars, of the oppressors, the people who you see as prominent, the people who you see as important, the people who you see as successful, the people who you aspire to be. I've indicated time and time again how you cannot have this 10% of the world's population ruling the other 90% unless that 10% keeps the 90% out of its mind. I can only achieve it can only achieve its dominance over the, over the other 90% through deception. The very essence of the identity of Satan, the devil, is that he is a deceiver. The very sources of his power, the very foundation of his bringing humankind down and destroying of mankind was through the lie. We must recognize that the white man's rule depends upon ongoing deceptions and lies. It is not about them telling us the truth, telling us what we need to hear, is telling us what's going to help us further be insane, put like that. So now we're going on to externalized perception. 
a people's ignorant of themselves are a people headed for disaster. One reason for the condition we are in today is a leadership that has not yet decided that it would determine a new reality and develop an Afrocentric reality, one that is suitable to the advancement and development of African people. We have a leadership that has rejected and dispensed and that has rejected and dispensed and dispensed with self-knowing for knowing of the enemy. We have a people who pride in the fact that they know more about the history of their enemies than they know about themselves, who pride in getting degrees in the history of their enemies while knowing nothing about who and what they are as a people. We have a leadership that has made us think that knowledge of self was not important, that knowledge of our oppressor was the only important knowledge, that knowledge of who and what he was about is the only knowledge of importance. Consequently, the more knowledge and education these leaders gain in terms of the knowledge of the oppressor, the more ignorant they become of themselves. We want to be like white people because white people is gods. White people is the pinnacle of humanity. So we got to be like the white people. So now we're going to the assimilationist treadmill. The illusions of progress. We have a leadership that has sought to get us to accept the status quo. The control of the world by the European. You errantly hear some of us conceding that it is the white man's world, so we may as well learn how to live in it or just get along. The assimilation is often accepts consequently, uh, excuse me, consciously or I consciously that the idea that the white man will continue to rule the world. He bases his ideology and political action on the concept that somehow our destiny is not to overthrow the white man, that our destiny is not to remove his pathological, this pathological person, that our destiny is not to suppress and bring these sick people under control, but to heal them in some sort of way, to convert them and to even become a part of them. Our destiny becomes not one that sees the very system and very ideology upon which these oppressors move as one of sickness and insanity and therefore in need of replacement by an African Senate and healthy ideology that comes out of our own self-knowing. This leadership wants us to accept the sickness as normality and to follow these pathological beings into self-destruction. And consequently, you will see the enemy's children and enemy's personality being held up as normal, as representing the norm. Our behavior to the degree at it, that it differs from our enemy is seen as deviant and thus abnormal. To that degree, we confuse equality with sameness, where we think that in order to be equal or greater than our enemy, that we have to be the same as our enemy. That's a great point. Equality does not equal sameness. The degree we think differences automatically represents inferiority, and therefore we become alarmed at anything that says that we are somehow different from our enemy. We must recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that racism is a sickness that the exploitation and wholesale, the, uh, the graping and pillaging of the earth by the European represents a pathology and illness. Therefore, our destiny is not one of trying to become a member of this gang of thieves, but to end its existence here on earth, to inhabit its rapturous ways and to bring this group of people to heal. So basically, the pathology of a colonized people is to want to become a part of the same people who created the pathologies within us in the first place, the same people who enslaved us in the first place, the same people who are the root cause of our issues and our problems in the first place. We want to heal those people. We want to become one with those people. We want to uh, understand those people and, and build with those people and integrate and assimilate into societies with these people while not giving a damn about what we're actually losing, what we're actually giving up, what we're actually turning our backs on. We've got a leadership that talks to us about equality of income. I've often pointed out the difference between income and wealth. We will not be equal to the white man when we have equal income. 
you you can get income from a salary but you can also get income from the ownership of resources a man can have a million dollars worth of land and get an income of ten thousand dollars and another can get an income of ten thousand dollars working for someone else even though they have equal incomes they are not the same wealthy wealth wise so we have a leadership that has sold us on income equality but not wealth it is a leadership that's going to look at income instead of ownership and control of African property and wealth. A leadership that looks at the amount of consumption as a gauge of its equality and looks at the degree to which it can consume as much as it master, as much as its master as its base of equality, not the degree to which it owns its means of production and has control over which its or which its own inherited wealth. So that's where I ended my reading at for this section um, on page 64. But I read, I actually, well, my reading is through page 66, but through what I wanted to talk about was through page 64, but read through page 66. But trying to recreate or trying to resemble white America is only going to help destroy us further. You got to remember. White America was created and set up upon the, a part of the foundation was the oppression of us. So to mimic a system that was created of the oppression of us will only aid and, and continue the oppression of us, right? You cannot mimic a system that's destructive to you. It will make it will you that that's self-sabotaging, that's self-destructive. But when your identity is tied into your oppressors, when you have been led to believe that in order for you to be somebody, to be seen as somebody, to be seen as viable, to be seen as human, to be seen as important, successful, you have to be acknowledged by your oppressors you have to be seen as successful in the eyes of your oppressors it's not how you view yourself it's not your own self ideal or your self-concept it is how your oppressors and your enemies view you that's the pathology that dr amos wilson is talking about that's the sickness that dr amos wilson is talking about our minds have been rearranged to believe that whiteness is the pinnacle of humanity and if we don't equate to whiteness then we have failed and that is one of our problems that's why we have to rearrange our minds we have to wake up we have to have a a paradigm shift we have to change the program that's in our brains and our minds we can no longer think the way we're thinking it's 2023 and it's getting worse this book was written in 99 and it's getting worse power numbers was written in 2001 it's getting worse um, the compensatory code was written in the 50s. Things are getting worse, but the words still reign true to this day because nothing has changed. It's only gotten worse. When you look at lectures from the 60s and hear what people are talking about and you swear they're talking about what's going on today because things have gotten worse. We've gotten worse. We've gotten dumber, lazier, more violent, more vile to each other. We hate ourselves. We love whiteness and hate blackness, but wonder why we're not progressing. Starts with you, self idea, self concept, self esteem, self love, self care. Starts with the self, with the African self, with the black self, black person, black man, black woman. Learn to love yourself. Read this information. Look at these videos. Read everything that that's designed for the black man, and the black woman to uplift themselves and learn to uplift yourself. But also frame it in reality. It has to be in a re in a realistic sense. It can't be in an ideological sense that has nothing to do with reality. If you don't deal with reality, that's what we started off with. If you don't deal with reality, you won't have a uh, a real outcome. Black America, we're fucked up. No other way to say it. We're fucked up right now in our time in America. You have individuals who are increasing their wealth, but us as a whole are getting worse. You have pockets of individuals who may be doing good, and that, but that has always happened. You have pockets of individual black individuals who are doing good doing slavery, but shit, slavery still existed. So don't be fooled by 
false realities of success or false realities of, of forward movement or false realities of, of, of black progress when it really is white progress and black skin. Wake up to the reality of where we are and who we are. And if we learn to love ourselves and see ourselves in a better light, we can therefore change our reality and improve our reality. And won't have to worry about our reality being the reality that was given to us by our oppressors. It's on us to save us. African Center Consciousness versus the New World Order. Page 43 to page 66. Get your read on. And, you know, we'll come back for the next video. I love you all. Make sure y'all catch the next video coming up.